Welcome to High Cheese. It's Friday, August 23rd, 2024. And still coming to you from parts unknown in the great state of Pennsylvania. And I watched uh, Kamala last night. And uh, to me, this was nothing more than just a, a pep rally. Nothing more than that. No substance. Because all she's asking us to do is forget everything. Forget everything I've done. Let's move ahead. Nothing to see here. All the chaos, all the havoc I've created on this economy, on our borders, internationally. Nothing to see there. Let's move on. And that was her speech last night. No policy. Because she can't hang her hat on any policy. Take a look at the two policy proposals she came out before this uh, speech. Price controls, artificially inflating demand on housing, which would result in increased housing prices. But she wants you to forget all of that. We have to move on. She's taking a page from Hillary. Remember Hillary's campaign? Move forward, something along those lines. But that's what she's asking the American people to do. Just ignore what I've done. High inflation, bordering chaos, bad economy, unending wars. She owns that. But she's trying to get the American people to forget it. Now, the uh, Democrat diehards, they're willing to forget it because they're willing to do anything. These are the low information voters that uh, Rush Limbaugh have always talked about. Just tell me anything. I'll believe you. I'll vote your way. But I don't think in the long run this is going to resonate with the American people. And then she's just trying to make us believe that. Oh, she's just a middle class girl. Her parents were a professor and a research assistant that traveled around the United States because her family frequently moved. The one thing she forgot to tell you about is the time she spent up in Montreal, Canada. Why did she not uh, talk about that? Why did she not talk about where she lived while she was living up in Montreal and Westmount? Probably the richest area of Montreal. But she doesn't want you to know that. She's just a middle class girl. She, that's what she wants you to believe. And then she went on to talk about we can't go back to Donald Trump and the chaos that he created. The chaos he created, the chaos he created, you created the chaos. We can't ignore this. You created it. Not Donald Trump. And then she went on to talk about, I'm a prosecutor. I got a history of being a prosecutor. I can prosecute people on the border. And I don't even know why she even bought this up that she's a prosecutor. Let's take a look at when she was a prosecutor. Let's take a look at California. But it's just this uh, vapid speech she gave last night. Just vapid. Meaningless. Nothing. No policy. Just the attacks on Donald Trump. And then she threw out some lies about Trump. One of the lies I think no one's talking about is she mentioned that, oh, she's, he sent his people on January 6th to try to take over the country. Something along those lines. That's a flat-out lie. Now, that to the Democrat base, maybe it means something, but not to most American people. And then they talk about this Project 2025 that uh, Donald Trump has disavowed. But the whole speech was just... Uh, Essentially a speech of nothing. Forget what I've done. Let's move forward. Because that's all she can say. What, what can she hang her hat on about what she's done? She can't hang her hat on regarding about anything. Because she has created the chaos. All she can do is just make up lies about Donald Trump and get people to hate him. And, and which is funny, the theme of uh, their convention was joy joy i didn't see many joyous faces in that crowd it's all contrived it's all manufactured 
those people in the audience, tell me how I want to look. Tell me what I have to do, and I'll do it. Because they're all automatons. And that's what the Democrat Party wants you to be, an automaton. Just listen to what I have to say. There's a small group of elites that are going to tell the American people what to do. And the perfect example is how Kamala didn't even receive one vote in the primary. She had to rip it away from Joe Biden. But that's okay with them because they are the elites and that's how they want to run this country. It's not about democracy. It's about we're in charge and we're going to tell you what to do. And if you disagree with us, you're an agent of chaos. But it was just a vapid speech. And I think what happened is that the uh, the expectations were so low for this convention that uh, you've got the left-wing pundits out say, hey, oh, it was a success. It was only a success because uh, Joe Biden wasn't there. They got rid of Joe Biden. And, you know, quite frankly, this is my own opinion on this. I really think that even if Joe Biden, in his feeble state of mind, was still running, I still think this uh, race is, would have been close. Now, it's still going to be close with uh, Kamala there. But I still think it would have been close with uh, Joe Biden there. Because these automatons will do anything that the Democrats tell them to do. Whether it was Joe Biden or not, the closer we got to the election, they would have gotten it in lockstep with the Democrat Party. So I wouldn't fret too much about Kamala being there because ultimately she's got no plan. She owns the chaos that she's created in this country. But you got to get out there and vote. You got to do what needs to be done to win. Get out and vote. Get your friends to vote. Talk about the chaos that uh, Kamala has created. And wants us to ignore. And it's clear that Kamala and the Democrats are agents of chaos. Let's take a look at their open border. We've let millions and millions of unvetted migrants into this country. And in many cases, terrorists. Which has resulted in the murder and rape of many women and children. We've got veterans being pushed out of housing in cities to make room for these illegals. Many of them have taken jobs from incumbent Americans, and that's not chaos. And Kamala's going to respond, well, we've tried to uh, pass some immigration law, but Donald Trump blocked it. Donald Trump and the Republicans blocked it. Well, let me tell you, that immigration law that uh, the Democrats wanted to pass, only codified the mess that we had at the border. That's all it did. Still, it, it still would have let massive amounts of people into this country, in, mon- in many cases unvetted. And all they had to do was keep Donald Trump's remain in Mexico policy. We wouldn't have to worry about our children getting raped. We wouldn't have to w- worry about women getting raped and murdered. And the excessive crime that it places on the incumbent American because of this policy. But this is how they work. Democrats want chaos. With that said, I want to go to a couple of articles here. And this one is from uh, the New York Post. And the headline says, Kamala Harris's bail fund endorsement helped put killer rapists back on the streets to offend again in the name of social justice. Kamala Harris helped a controversial bail fund rake in millions of dollars, which it spent on getting violent criminals back on the street in the name of social justice, only for some of them to commit more crime, including murder. Among the free criminals, a twice convicted male sex offender who went on to allegedly assault other women before his rearrest, and a man who left a victim with a traumatic brain injury after being sprung from jail while awaiting trial for another felony assault. And this is a fund that uh, Kamala endorsed while she was a senator. Let's take a look at another article here. 
is from the Heritage Foundation. It has to do with, uh, it was in 2021, California passed a law that holds that stealing merchandise worth $950 or less is just a misdemeanor, which means that law enforcement probably won't bother to investigate. And if they do, prosecutors will let it go. So essentially in California, and this is where Kamala comes from, if you get caught stealing $950 or less, you walk. You'll never be called to a trial. And what's the result? Massive, massive theft in these stores. Let's take a look at San Francisco. San Francisco is once a beautiful city. Now people are fleeing. And this is the America that Kamala wants. But I've often talked about that uh, this is part of the equation for the Democrats. Create chaos and then try to pass some laws that uh, make it look like they're doing something about it. And with that said, I want to go to an article here from CNBC. And it says here, and this is from earlier in the week, it says here, California cracks down on organized retail crime with a new package of laws. It says California Democrat Governor Gavin Newsom has signed 10 new bills into law that take aim at retail crime in the state. The package announced on Friday includes new laws that crack down on shoplifting theft from a vehicle, organized theft, and online marketplaces where stolen goods are sometimes resold. The new law comes after retailers have called on both local and federal governments to do more to combat retail theft, citing it as a growing challenge that has impacted profits, customers, and staff. So here's the chaotic package that the Democrats love to do. They create the chaos, and when it's politically expedient, they try to do something about this. Now, isn't it timely that uh, Gavin Newsom would pass this law after they created the mess several years ago with uh, making certain crimes a misdemeanor? But again, this is how they work. They create the chaos and then try to say, I'm going to cure it. Because their voters are dumb. They don't put two and two together. But most American people see through this, and this is why ultimately Donald Trump is going to win. Now, I've got some really good listeners, and uh, as Rush Limbaugh would call them, high information voters. And I want to go to a comment that I received from uh, one of my listeners. Her name is Debbie, and I don't want to mention her last name because I'm not sure if she you know, wants her full name mentioned, but uh, Debbie sends me a, a question, and it says, uh, Mark MarketWatch is stating that the stock market already predicts that uh, Harris has a 58% chance of winning. I'd like your opinion on this Democratic gaslighting. I'm afraid that it may work. Can you expound more? Well, Debbie, that's a really good question. And uh, one thing, just a couple of uh, things I just wanted to point out. Now, Market Watch is owned by Dow Jones. And uh, Rupert Murdoch and his family own Dow Jones. And we know that Rupert Murdoch is not a big fan of Donald Trump. And we know that his sons have become involved with this company, and they're extreme left people. So you got to take that with a grain of salt. But one thing to take notice is that The stock market tends to go up during an election year. And the reason it goes up during the election year is those in the White House, in this case, Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, she's doing everything she can to um, keep this market going up. But what she's been doing is she's taking this massive debt that we've been accumulating in the government and selling short-term treasuries to fund the government. And what uh, you're doing when you sell a massive amount of short-term treasuries, you're creating a lot of liquidity for the stock market, which is which is what they like. So it tends to help prop up the uh, the stock market. And so that's what uh, Yellen is doing. Now the Fed is doing things also. Uh, You're going to see the Fed come out with a a, a interest rate reduction. That's going to help stocks go up. So. The conventional wisdom is that that is going to help the incumbent. So Kamala is actually the incumbent. Is she actually going to benefit from this? Because she's running away from the administration. 
she'd love for, for people to not know that she's actually the vice president of the United States. So she, she's running, she's trying to run away from the whole incumbency thing. So I'm not sure if she's even going to try to take advantage of this to, um, stock market going up. Now, with that said, I want to go to a clip. It's with uh, Scott Bessent. And, and Scott Bessent is the CEO of KeySquare. It's a, a big Wall Street fund. And uh, he's also an economist also. And he's saying that this market that's going up is a Donald Trump market. And Donald Trump has already said that because, look, the market's going up because people think I'm going to get elected. And and you have Jim Cramer from uh, CNBC, although I'm not a big fan of his. He's saying that if you, uh, if you like your investments, uh, you're going to want to vote for Donald Trump. So getting back to Besson, and Besson's just saying that, is that he's, uh, he's tracked the stock market over the past year, and he's noticed that any time there's been positive news for Donald Trump in the polls or whatever, the market's gone up. So let's go to this clip with Besson, and he's being interviewed by Bloomberg, and then we'll come back and discuss. Scott, one of the things I found fascinating in your note was you have a chart in there that basically tracks... Uh, where the S&P 500 is gaining versus where Trump is versus Biden in the polls, which is pretty stunning. It tends to say the more Trump gets ahead in the polls, the better the market does. And when Biden gets ahead in the polls, it's flat or even a little bit down. Yeah, so th that's correct. You know, I, I did put the normal disclaimers. There are not a lot of episodes, not a lot of observations. Um, you know, there's a lot of serial correlation in there. But directionally, I think it's correct. And the magnitude as you said, is quite big. The, uh, on periods when Trump is up, we've had a cumulative gain of 35%. Periods when Biden's up, it's 3%. And this interview was done during uh, when Biden was still the nominee. But it does seem to make sense. If you can remember about a month ago when you, when you had that massive sell-off on Wall Street, I think the Dow was down over 1,000 points. That was likely a response to these polls that were out there, these these skewed polls by the mainstream media that showed that uh, Kamala Harris was surging in the polls. So Wall Street got scared. They went down 1,000 points. Now it's come back up since then. And to me, that indicates that Wall Street thinks that things have stabilized and Trump is looking good for November. And one thing I just want to add to this. You know, while we're talking about different charts and different trends, um, did you know that a sitting vice president rarely wins a presidential election? Think about it. I, I, how many years do you have to go back? It's been a long time, but rarely do sitting vice presidents ever win the election. So that's something to think about. And regarding the gaslighting, they're intentionally trying to do this. They're trying to get the Trump voter discouraged so they don't come out and vote. But it only works if you get discouraged. Listen to where it's coming from. We're not low-information voters. We can connect the dots. And when we see this gaslighting, we know what it is. It's gaslighting. But like I said, if we do what we need to do, get out the vote, get your friends to vote, we're going to win. And speaking about gaslighting, here's some economic gaslighting. And I want to go to an article here. It's uh, from CNBC. And it says here, non-farm payroll growth revised down by 818,000, the Labor Department said. The U.S. economy created 818,000 fewer jobs than originally reported during the 12-month period through March 2024. 818,000. It's the highest revision downward since 2009. So all these uh, economic data that we've had coming out from the White House and the administration have been overestimated. Let's call it economic gaslighting. They want to make it appear that things are better than they really are. 
Now, remember, the truth always comes out. And this is a massive number. So from April 2023 through March of 2024, so all the jobs that were created, as reported by the government, were false to the tune of 818,000. You know, it's either incompetence or they're doing it intentionally. And in either case, it's not good. It just undermines our confidence in the administration. So this new number implies a monthly job gain of 174,000 as opposed to the initial indication of 242,000. That's a dramatic difference. I think it's 30%. And you think about it, if you're off by 30% in whatever you do at work, you're likely going to be fired. But so the report could be seen as an indication that the labor market is not as strong as the previous reporting had made it out to be. So this report went through March 2024. So let's see what kind of numbers they come out with from April 1st through November. It's going to be really interesting, but we're going to have to watch these numbers. Are they going to continue to overinflate these numbers in order to help Kamala? We have to assume so at this point. So we shall see. And I think one person who sees through these gaslighting polls, particularly on the national level, is uh, David Axelrod. Now, this is the former Obama political advisor. And I'm going to go to a clip with him, and it's from last Sunday. And uh, he kind of cuts right to the chase and uh, lets us know where we are right now with this uh, election. So let's go to this clip, and then we'll come back and discuss. This is still a very competitive race. If the election were today, I'm not sure who would win. And I I think it may well be President Trump because it's an electoral college fight. And in those battleground states, you know, for a Democrat to win those battleground states, they have to have a significant lead in the electoral college. Remember, Joe Biden won by 7 million votes nationally nationally last time and a margin of 45,000 votes or 44,000 votes in the three closest mm-hmm. battleground states combined. So so Axelrod is saying, don't get too uh, hyped up on these national polls because it all comes down to the swing states, um, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, Nevada, Georgia. That's where the battle is going to be won. And if you look at these swing states, Donald Trump has a much easier path to getting 270 electoral votes than Kamala Harris. And Axelrod realizes this. So we shall see. True to its name, it was the party of democracy. As you know, I left that party in October because it had departed so dramatically on the core values that I grew up with. It had become the party of war, censorship, corruption, big pharma, big tech, big ag, and big money. Ultimately, the only thing that will save our country and our children is if we choose to love our kids more than we hate each other. That's why I launched my campaign to unify America. My dad and uncle made such an enduring mark on the character of our nation, not so much because of any particular policies that they promoted, but because they were able to inspire profound love for our country and to fortify our sense of ourselves as a national community held together by ideals. They were able to put their love into the intentions and hearts of ordinary Americans and to unify a national populist movement of Americans, blacks and whites, Hispanics, urban and rural Americans, inspired affection and love and high hopes and a culture of kindness that continued to radiate among Americans from their memory. That's the spirit on which I ran my campaign and that I intend to bring into the campaign of President Trump. And this is good news. Now, there were rumors 
throughout the week that uh, RFK Jr. was going to suspend his campaign and endorse Donald Trump, which is what he did about a half hour ago. And did I say this is good news? Now you're going to get the Democrats saying, oh, it doesn't really help Trump. Yeah, it, this helps Trump. It's going to be a close race, and this endorsement by RFK Jr. could be enough to put him over. And I do think that in many of the swing states, he's going to be very helpful. Now, he took his name off the ballot in all the swing states. He's uh, he's kept his name on the ballot in all the uh, non-swing states. But, you know, places like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, the Kennedy name still resonates among people, still resonates among Democrats. And he can have an appeal there. So overall, I think this is a good day for Donald Trump. It's a good day for America. And with that said, thank you very much for listening. You have a good week, and I will talk to you next Saturday.